I'm looking to someone to give me a signal to begin. <laughs> okay, Patent Office says I can go. Uh, good afternoon, I guess good morning. Still, my name is Ingrid de Karinja Berzinha. I teach intellectual property law at the Riga Graduate School of Law. But full disclosure, I'm an IP lawyer, a trademark and design attorney, and a partner with a law firm of Raidla Lange and Norcus. So uh, this panel is dedicated to all the lawyers, judges, right holders, and law enforcement people in the audience. Uh, we will be speaking on IP enforcement from now until our final discussion and final coffee break. So a few introductory words. Intellectual property is property, a bundle of legal rights related to ownership. And the previous panels have dis uh, discussed how intellectual property is created, how the rights are secured, how IP is commercialized, all these sorts of affirmative rights, the right to use, commercialize, gain benefit from intellectual property. The other category of rights are negative rights, the right to exclude others. This process of excluding others is enforcement, the use of civil, administrative, and criminal measures to prevent unauthorized use of intellectual property to sanction such use, and to provide remedies to rights holders. Some of the time, the state is the primary actor in stopping infringement. Customs, police, and the courts have the vast task of dealing with the hydra of trade and counterfeits and infringement that is increasingly online. Alongside law enforcement, of course, the right holder must be, to borrow a phrase from one of our speakers, the policeman monitoring the marketplace, initiating civil actions, patent invalidation, trademark oppositions, to exercise their exclusive rights. Why is enforcement so important? Losses to industry and missed tax receipts measure in the billions of euros. Second, enforcement measures ensure that the inventor, designer, creator, and investor derive their fair benefit from intellectual efforts and investment. In the market, of course, enforcement is critical to ensure that the consumer does not bear the burden of verifying the source of each good or service. Ladies and gentlemen, we are so pleased today to welcome a distinguished panel to discuss intellectual property rights enforcement from various viewpoints, and we look forward to a productive discussion. A uh, bit of housekeeping, we will have four presenters, and then at the conclusion, we will have uh, time for your questions. Our first speaker is Paul Meyer, who is the director of the EU Observatory on Infringement of IPR in Alicante, Spain. Uh, he is a native of Strasbourg, France, a graduate of the Institute for Political Sciences and the Faculty of Law in Strasbourg and the College of Europe in Bruges, has worked for counsel for various trade associations, and became uh, an EC civil servant in the EC Commission in 1987. From 1990 to 1995, he worked in the field of intellectual property law in the Commission. He joined the Office for the Harmonization in the Internal Market in 1995 as Chief Advisor to the President of the Office. Next, he was responsible for the preparations of OHIM in view of the enlargement of the EU, was Director of the Design Departments from 2002, nominated President of the Boards of Appeal, uh, in 2005 and confirmed for a second mandate in 2010. And since January 2013, Paul Meyer has been appointed as the new director of the OHIM Observatory, which incorporates the EU Observatory on IP Infringement and also the OHIM Academy. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Meyer. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. I would first like to thank the Latvian presidency and the Latvian office for the invitation and the great organization of this uh, meeting. I will be talking about um, the challenges of IP enforcement under the angle of what we do in the EU observatory in uh, Alicante and actually way beyond Alicante. Alicante is only the spot of the secretariat of uh, what we do. The observatory is indeed um, facing a number of challenges. Uh, enforcement is a challenge, is the real challenge. As you just uh, rightly said, Professor, by way of introduction, it's nice to have rights, 
but you have to make sure that these rights also are enforced, are efficient, and can bring you the return of the investment and the creativity that you have put into everything uh, you have uh, prepared, created, or innovated with. So the EU Observatory is um, actually now a little more than five years old. It was created precisely because enforcement more and more has become a central issue uh, for all the authorities dealing with intellectual property. And what was the recognition? Well, the recognition was that you had to bring together the public and the private sector because it is the only way to be efficient in the enforcement of intellectual property rights. One cannot do without the others. The public authorities, of course, uh, have the role of making sure that laws are applied in the member states. But when it comes to intellectual property, I mean, these are private rights. And who better than the owner of the right knows what his rights are, how much he has, what he wants to do with them, and how difficult it is eventually to copy or not copy what he has protected. And so by working together to help identify the rights on the one hand by the private sector, make sure on the public sector side that the full force of the law is put behind enforcement, there you obtain an efficient uh, fight against infringements of intellectual property rights. And that is a fight that will never end. We will always have problems of intellectual property rights enforcement and violations. So yes, bringing together the public and the private sector are creating a network of all interested in the matter to work together to create synergies, exchanges, and make sure that we are as efficient as we can in the fight against counterfeiting. And this is why the observatory, as I said, is not just a secretariat in Alicante, far from that. The, the observatory is actually, in the meantime, has become a huge network. All 28 member states are represented uh, in uh, our meetings. Different uh, national authorities of the various member states, customs, police, the intellectual property offices, uh, universities to uh, some extent in some cases as well are brought together. It's amazing to see how many international and European federations uh, of right owners or people that have a direct business interest in intellectual property exist. So far we have 58 members from the private sector. Right holders, collecting societies, uh, patent agents, trademark agents, uh, uh, all sectors of industry from textile to the automobile industry, etc., etc. They all come together to work on this. One important element is that the um, enforcement of intellectual property, also more and more, is a question that has political importance and direct consequences on the civil society. And this is why in the regulation is it said that uh, we should bring together also representatives from uh, consumers, uh, civil society in general, patients, and this is why we have so far uh, seven members of uh, civil society represented in the observatory. Then fighting against counterfeiting, of course, is something, um, is a field of action in which many organizations over the last, uh, certainly two decades, the last decade, have been active with. And uh, if you look at the problem, uh, it is actually more one of trying to coordinate people who already do very good things very well, but either limited from a sectorial point of view or from a geographical point of view. And so we have to bring together a number of people uh, to make sure, and a number of organizations to make sure that we do not do double work. We do not work in such a way that we actually annihilate our respective efforts in the fight against counterfeiting and piracy. Make sure, in other words, that we are efficient with the use of public money. And so one of the main roles of the observatory is also to coordinate a certain number of uh, 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 public uh, authorities. Of course, the European Commission is a major player in this. This is an EU agency, and various directors general of the European Commission work with us. You have a list of the most important there. We do coordinate also with uh, uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization, the World Customs Organization, the OECD, uh, CEPO, Europe Just, et cetera, et cetera. And an important part is that since uh, intellectual property enforcement has become so important, as I said, for civil society, and that all this has political consequences, we have 10 members of the European Parliament that follow our work very closely. 
Now, how do we function? Um, we have a certain number of meetings uh, that we hold in the observatory on a regular basis. A plenary once a year, bringing together all the people that uh, you have just seen the list of, or organizations. We meet with public stakeholders uh, once or twice a year, uh, depending on the presidency. We will have a meeting here again uh, very soon in April. Uh, we have private stakeholder meetings. And where the work really happens is the working groups. We have five working groups through which all the initiatives that we have are presented, scrutinized, and eventually adopted on the basis of a procedure uh, to define the terms of reference of the various studies that we undertake. In some specific cases, we also work with subgroups. Now, the working groups of uh, the observatory uh, met uh, last week in Alicante. Uh, everything went well, and uh, we now have a, a full program of the things to do for the month to come. What do we do? What are the roles of the observatory? Well, basically, there are four to make studies to better understand intellectual property, its mechanisms, its importance from an economic point of view, uh, the importance also of infringement, I will come back to this. Tools, practical tools uh, to help enforcers uh, do their job and be as efficient as possible in the fight against piracy and counterfeiting. Raise awareness, a very major uh, element uh, for us because if we want to better protect intellectual property, it is also necessary that our consumers, our fellow citizens, our decision makers, mm. our enforcers, our judges actually understand the importance of intellectual property. Okay? Last but not least, we do a number of trainings for all these uh, various uh, parts of the enforcement authorities. So, well, just a few results rapidly on uh, what uh, we have had uh, in terms of results so far uh, in the EU observatory. First, studies. What is the perception of Europeans uh, when it comes to intellectual property? First, a very good figure. 96% um, of Europeans thinks it's important to protect uh, the rights of artists and their wealth. This is fantastic. This is great. Everybody thinks that if you create something, you should be protected for it, and you should be in a position to be rewarded for it. 76% um, innovation and intellectual property go hand in hand. This is all very good, but the picture changes a little bit, or actually considerably. If you then look at the consumer and ask them, um, what do you think? Do you think that purchasing a counterfeit product can be justified? And there, very unfortunately, we have double-digit figures, and sometimes high ones, of what the consumers think. And 34% of EU citizens think that buying counterfeit products allows making a smart purchase. 38% think that it's an act of protest, actually. Again, you know, big companies, market-driven economy, et cetera, et cetera. So we have uh, still some very strong lefted pulsions in the European society, apparently, okay? So 96% think it's good to protect intellectual property, but they're ready to buy counterfeits. Even if, actually, only very few admit that they do so. It's around 10% only, okay? When it comes to downloading, when it comes to downloading, the figures, I would say, are even worse. 22% uh, of Europeans consider it acceptable to download or access copyright-protected material illegally, okay? And this goes up to 32% when it comes to the youngsters of the European Union, the people from 15 to, 20, to 24 years old, okay? And when it comes to... Um, acceptable to download or access copyright protected uh, uh, content illegally when it is for personal loose, use, sorry, 57% of our youngsters think that this is something which is acceptable. In other words, people tend to think that intellectual property is important, but uh, it's in their way. You know, they, they, they want to do what they like. They want to have what they want immediately, for free, and as easily as possible. And so you see already that there's a considerable uh, a field of work for us uh, ahead of us to try and, and change this. Another study that we made, and you heard about it, of course, it's, uh, it's, it's now, I think, rather famous, is the study on IP-intensive industries, and just a few figures. Indeed, 26%, uh, a little more than a quarter of the jobs in the European Union are jobs created directly by IP-intensive industries. 
That shows how important intellectual property is in the economy. Uh, we're not saying that if there was no intellectual property, all this job would go, right? We're just saying that intellectual property as it is, the economy as it functions, uh, creates 26% of jobs in the part of the economy that uses intellectual property intensively. That even goes up to 35% if you include indirect jobs, and 39% of GDP. So 26% of employment generates 39% of GDP, which clearly shows that IP-intensive industries create much more value per capita than the others in Europe. The wage premium is important as well, over 30%. Last but not least, uh, nine out of 10 things that the European Union exports are exported by IP intensive industries. This gives us, I think, a very clear picture of how important intellectual property is for us in Europe. And actually, if you make the comparison with the United States of America, our figures are, I don't know whether better or worse, higher, okay? Because 26% uh, of jobs uh, in uh, the European Union compared to only, I would say only, 19% in the United States of America. Now, there are two reasons that we have uh, identified that can explain this difference. The first one is that in the American comparative study, they have not taken into account designs. And um, I do think that uh, they would have to think again on how they protect their designs over there. It's a personal opinion. Secondly, and that was said by uh, Anselm uh, um, earlier this morning, this is absolutely true. I mean, this is also the result of us uh, creating an internal market within the 28 member states of the European Union. Because a number of the jobs that stayed in the European Union cannot stay in the United States of America in comparable uh, sectors of the industry. Because there, if they want to uh, make gains on labor costs and so on, they cannot stay in the United States, and therefore the whole job is exported either to Mexico or to China. So this is why we have higher figures than the United States of America. You know, leave it at that for the, for the time being. The other figures are comparable. Another important element is that we have, of course, various rights in intellectual property. And what is interesting to see is that a large section of European industries is actually very uh, active uh, in, in, this, in, in intellectual property in the various fields of IP. So they're patent intensive, trademarks intensive, design intensive, copyright intensive, all this at the same time. And this is the first discovery that we have. Now we try to quantify um, uh, intellectual property uh, infringement. And there, uh, we are working on a number of themes. I just want to give you uh, one figure which is actually not on the screen. We have uh, finalized our study on the cost of infringement in the cosmetic sector. The cosmetic sector in the EU is losing 4.7 billion euros of legitimate savings because of counterfeiting. There's more than 51,000 legitimate jobs in the European Union lost because of that, and 1.7 billion of government revenue. So I'm pushed a little bit here, so I will go uh, much further than that. Uh, and uh, these are the details that you will find uh, in, in the uh, presentation, okay? So some instruments, uh, briefly. Um, we have two main uh, instruments that we work on for the time being. First is the enforcement database. What's the enforcement database? The enforcement database brings together three things. Our database with all the trademark and design registrations in Europe, trademark view and design view. Uh, the uh, application uh, for action that you fill in for, to ask customs authorities to eventually stop counterfeit products from entering the European market, uh, and the elements of interchange between the uh, owner of the intellectual property right and the customs authorities. We already have uh, around 120 companies working on this. We are just now finalizing a roadshow in all the countries of the European Union. We were here uh, in Latvia uh, in late December uh, to show customs authorities how the database functions. Uh, the database is now available and accessible to all uh, the uh, enforcement authorities in the European Union from the customs side and more and more police forces and gendarmerie forces make it uh, available to themselves as well. Basically, it's bringing together the information, as I said in the introduction, of the right holders who best know what the problems are, where the counterfeits come from, 
and customs and authorities in general to help stop the imports or then the imparting of uh, such products in the markets of the European Union. Uh, we now want to um, uh, interface this also with the system of the European Commission COPIS to make things easier so that there's no need for second encoding. The World Customs Organization also has a system and we're working on the compatibility of the two systems. As I said, we want to create synergy. We're not, we're not creating competing systems. We don't want to do double work. We don't want losing public money, okay? We want to be as efficient as possible, so this is what we do. Um, ASSIST is the database in which uh, we want to bring together all the data of uh, seizures of counterfeit products in Europe. We have all the figures for the uh, customs seizures in the European Union, at least when it comes to border measures. Uh, customs are also active inside the territory of a number of countries, notably France. We are getting these figures. Police is still a big challenge for us. We need to get the figures from the police and their interventions in the fight against counterfeiting. And this is difficult because in a number of countries, they simply do not hold the uh, figures for all this. ACRIS is a database uh, that we will uh, not talk about very long. It will just help uh, enterprises to report the problems they encountered in intellectual property uh, in third countries. Okay? Now, with all these three databases taken together, we will have, in a few years, very soon from now, actually, a very good picture of the importance of IP, of the importance of infringement, and where the sources are, what the roots are for importing this product, and actually where the origin of uh, the, the, the problem is. Often work registry, uh, I will just uh, pass over. I spoke about youth. Youth is um, the key for all this. 57 of our youngst percent of our youngsters think it's uh, nice and uh, does not pose a problem to download illegally well, but then we will have to educate them probably, okay? And so what we want to do is to create a real youth scoreboard uh, based first on a, um, a questionnaire to a number of people. Uh, we have also had uh, quality uh, interviews with a number of them to try and see what their really feeling is. You know, what are the messages that they actually would be sensitive to? Uh, obviously, if you come in moralizing, uh, our young generation is likely to turn its back, go back home to their rooms and their beds, where on their tablets or whatever they have in their hands, they will continue to do what they used to do so far. Okay, so you have to catch their attention. You have to make sure that somebody speaks to them that sounds convincing, it will not be me, uh, that they are ready to listen to, and that the arguments are found that they will be sensitive to. SME scoreboard, well, we want to do a lot in terms of small and medium-sized enterprises. Sia Squazzotti said a lot about what uh, Iporta has been doing. We will be working with them more and more also in the future. There too, we want to create a scoreboard. We want to know what SMEs really think about innovation, or their leaders certainly, how they protect their innovation, if any, uh, and how we can best help them. So this is why, again, uh, we will have a, a, a specialized company, GFK, We'll be holding the interviews with several thousand European companies. We'll try to know better what their needs are in terms of intellectual property and how we can best uh, protect our rights. And on that basis, we will continue to improve uh, the messages uh, to make sure that we find the right messengers as well, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one thing, and then I will uh, finish, is a funding scheme that we have launched um, early in January. Uh, the people have now until end of March to respond. What is that? As I said, there, there are a lot of good awareness campaigns uh, on intellectual property in the member states. However, very often there's a financing problem. Uh, there is also some sort of, I would say, coordination problem for which in the Observer should be helped as well. We have a toolkit that lists 140 European and national campaigns in Europe, sorry, uh, uh, in, the, in awareness. We want to help. We want to help also from a financial point of view, and the scheme is foreseen in such a way. We have dedicated uh, so far um, half a million euro to this, uh, so people send in uh, their projects. The maximum grant is 50,000 euro. Uh, you have until end of March if you want to do this. I'm not allowed to say more than that because it's a public tender procedure, so I'm not supposed to help anybody here in particular, okay? But we will have a committee who will look at that. <coughs> we will have a, a group of youngsters also looking at the projects to see <coughs> if they see anything that would be interesting for them, and then ultimately the president will sign uh, the, the agreement to uh, finalize this. The last actions that we have is training. We do a lot of training. 
We do a lot of training for enforcement authorities and for judges. Uh, the office has been uh, working with the judges for now six years. More than 600 uh, judges in trademarks and designs have come to Alicante in seminars where they share among themselves. We don't call it training, but this is what it is in the end. Uh, we will hold, uh, again, two regional seminars that bring together prosecutors, customs officers, police officers, okay? Uh, one uh, will be held uh, uh, very soon uh, in, uh, in the southern uh, of Europe. Italy will organize it. Uh, we're happy to know that uh, we have uh, agreed and we're now organizing the second one, which will be hosted in Hungary end of October um, and uh, very early in November. Um, I think I'll stop my jogging around my slides now. And uh, I will be uh, listening to your questions uh, with uh, great interest. Am I reasonable with time? Yes, sir. Okay, fine. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, reassuring to know that the EU Observatory is uh, so actively uh, seeking to help the public and private sectors work together to combat uh, IP enforcement. Uh, our next speaker will be speaking on a very hot topic uh, in intellectual property uh, today on IPD, IP aspects of 3D printing, which is really the next frontier. Ansel Kumpelman Sanders. Professor of Intellectual Property Law at Maastricht University. Uh, he is Director of the Advanced Masters IP Law and Knowledge Management and also Academic Director of the Institute for Globalization and International Regulation at Maastricht University. Director of the Annual Intellectual Property Law School and IP Seminar of the Institute for European Studies of Macau in China. Uh, he holds a PhD from the Center of Commercial Law Studies, Queen Mary University of London. He's very active in IP training, curricular de curriculum development, consultancy projects, and a member of the advisor or editorial boards of a number of publications, including Intellectuelle Eigendom and Reklamerecht, the Maastricht Journal of European and Comparative Law, and Intellectual Property Quarterly. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction and thank you very much to the organizers of this wonderful event. Um, I will try to, um, to, to fit this presentation in with the topic of enforcement, although some of the aspects will have to deal with other uh, elements as well, so patentability and so on. Also, I will look at uh, the issue of 3D printing a bit broader. I will also look at bioprinting. Uh, and even touch upon some aspects of the Internet of Things. In essence, everything that is disruptive to IP on the one side uh, and on the other side creates, I think, wonderful opportunities for right holders to think different and to uh, use their IP somewhat differently. So, on to the first slide. So, what is 3D printing? Uh, in essence, uh, it all started in 86, and you can see here the 3D systems basic patent for 3D printing. And um, you can even see on the right-hand side the 2014 recipient of uh, one of the EPO's uh, Inventor of the Year awards, Mr. Charles Hull, um, who developed um, the, the initial patent, which is the base patent for 3D printing. And you, as you can see, it is substantially dealing with the way in terms of layering uh, matter on top of each other in order to build a three-dimensional uh, product. So why should that interest us today? Um, well, just take as an example insurers who have already um, announced that they are planning to use not just 3D printers but also 3D scanners to offer repairs to products that you may have broken in your home. They will come to your home with their scanner and printer and you give them your broken item for which you wish to claim insurance and there and then on the spot they will uh, produce for you a replacement part. And um, you can see that uh, some of these European um, um, groups of, um, of insurers think that this is a, an excellent idea. So what is the potential impact on, on IP? Um, 
here I think it, we can also see the disruptive elements. It's not just professional bodies that will, or professional actors, commercial actors, that will have access to 3D printing, but also end consumers. For 1,200 euros, you can already purchase yourself a 3D printer. Um, and although the material that you can print with, which is um, plastics, is not suitable for, for really stronger type of products, you can see that uh, really the, uh, the market will, uh, will enable end consumers to have access to both scanning and printing facilities in the foreseeable future. And this raises a number of issues. In relation to industrial property law, you know that there is this hard barrier between commercial and private actors. So that means that in terms of your enforcement for right holders, your design rights or your patent rights will not be enforceable against end users, private individuals. So that will raise a number of secondary liability issues. Can you hold producers of 3D printers themselves liable for the infringements committed uh, with their product? Um, how do we deal, in, in essence, also with repair uh, in patent and design law when it concerns commercial actors? And these are not areas where we see a lot of harmonization in Europe uh, as yet. We see with the number of staple goods cases, most notably the Senseo coffee machine cases and the, uh, the cups cases in various jurisdictions that also are definitions in patent law in the various member states on secondary patent infringement differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, resulting in different outcomes. When it concerns copyright issues in terms of the scans or the computer-aided design files that you will need in order to generate 3D printed products, yes, there is a liability potentially for also private end users. Copyright does not distinguish, after all, between the economic activity or the private activity. Nevertheless, we quite often see already in relation to internet downloading and the like, the argument that one is only copying or reproducing for personal needs. File sharing of computer-aided design files and scans have already resulted in legislation. So let's look at some of these cases. Um, the first one is purely commercial. Here the story is relatively straightforward. And for, for some reason, the most active litigant is Games Workshop, which also shows you again that the younger generation is particularly affected by 3D printing. Um, Games Workshop produces a number of figurines for war games and the like, um, immensely popular with gamers. And um, the uh, ongoing litigation, it's really ongoing between G Games Workshop and its competitor, Chapter House Studios, um, shows that, yes, in this arena, it is possible for right holders to enforce their rights. And here you see the examples of Chapter House producing uh, sort of the replica figures of uh, Games Workshop. But what happens in more private settings? Here we have the example of Warhammer, again a Games Workshop um, uh, product, where we have private individuals sharing um, on Thingiverse, which is the internet sharing site for any files that can be produced on MakerBot 3D printers, the files for tanks and indeed these walkers and these are different. They are not the same ones that were produced by Games Workshop, but they are variations on the same items. They are in the, um, um, in, in the, the light of the, um, the hobbyist, they are simply variations on a given theme. And you can see that the users of the, the printers, as well as 
the uploaders of these files, do not consider that they are doing anything wrong. So if I go to the next slide, these are some of the replicas that were produced, and you can simply print them. There is no money changing hands, and so here you have the reaction of one of those file sharers of files. I was notified by Thingiverse that the DMCA takedown has happened. It was automatic after Games Workshop made the claim. The models are mine. I created them from scratch. I believe the issue was with the distribution of the files that carry the likeness to their IP. They are obligated to protect their IP, but no money was trading hands. It was fan art. There was no confusion as to what it was. It was labeled as unlicensed, unofficial, and I uploaded it under an, a non-commercial license. Well, this is one of these typical responses um, that our previous speaker was already alluding to. Young people do not consider this type of activity infringing at all. Um, and they believe that this is perfectly a legitimate activity. And to some extent, you can see, if it is truly the case that he created the file from scratch, it's a variation on a theme. But what is this? Is it, this is a legitimate um, a form of fan art or parody or what have you. Let me then turn to bioprinting. I think there are even more issues to consider there. So perhaps you have heard this as well, but 3D printing has now also extended into biology. So tissues and organs can be bioprinted. In my own university at Maastricht, the first uh, printed hamburger was produced. Very useful, but there you go. Um, and it's already been predicted that 3D bioprinting will create even more disruptions to, to the IP system. Um, and you can see some of the, the bioprints printers uh, on, on, the, uh, on the slide here. So in essence, we are dealing with products of nature. The whole discussion on whether um, the matter that is produced by means of bioprinting may be patentable uh, will come up again. So we have had the Myriad case in the US, and also in Europe we've had discussions in relation to human embryonic stem cells and the patentability thereof in the Bristler case. What is clear, however, is that the public debate is driving the issues here in terms of biotechnology. And we really have to then ask ourselves, from an IP perspective, what is possible, what is patentable, but also what will be desirable? What will be the regulatory environment related to bioprinting? So, in terms of methods, I see no problems in terms of patentability there. In terms of hardware, also no problems there. The first patents have been taken out in this respect as well. The things you see here are, are have a, however, mock-ups of what these things will look like. But you can already see in the laboratories that they are producing printing hard valves on, on sort of tissue that they put in an oven and they can have, take from a private individual cells in order to grow heart valves and actually test several of them before they decide on the one to implant into the patient. This will, of course, also raise issues, after all, in relation to private medicine and um, the use of your own biological tissue material in order to create something that will be implanted back into you. The overlap between uh, bioprinting and uh, 3D printing is also seen in the field of prosthetics. Um, most notably here, what is bioprinted are bone tissues uh, and uh, parts of, of skull material or, and, and the like. Um, <clears throat> it has uh, huge advantages over using metals or other allies because you can already print the, um, the exact way where the new implant would fit the bone. And that means that the bone and the implant can grow together uh, at a much better, better pace.
Also there we will have issues related to software, the data that is collected, the design of the prosthetics. Would they fall under IP, yes or no, or would indeed in the interest of science uh, and access to medicine that discussion flare up once more? So there is an issue in relation to the public-private dichotomy in IP law in relation to industrial property. There will be more and more need for personalized products and implants also then raising the question whether there should be any IP in relation to those products or implants. And ethical questions will be asked on the patentability, <coughs> I think, even more frequently. So, to top it all off, <coughs> something more to consider. We've already heard about the Internet of Things. Um, what is the Internet of Things? It's already a number that is quite staggering. There will be 30 billion connected devices by the year 2020. <clears throat> and all these are physical objects that contain controllers, sensors, and have a connection to the online environment. That is the Internet of Things. What does that allow you to do? It really creates products that are also services. And this is very interesting for producers because it means that through <coughs> an Internet of Things enabled device, you have <coughs> a complete and direct link with the end user. It's a license in relation to any software or any form of media that is embedded, that can be communicated through the thing that somebody owns. So all consumer products connected will become a service. So, some examples that are already on the market. The Tesla car. The Tesla car is an Internet of Things device. It's not just a car. It is continuously upload, updated by the dealer. It co continuously gathers data and sends it to the dealer. A number of months ago when there was a problem, a technical problem with one of uh, with one of the component parts in the car, the entire car, all cars will, were instantly updated by one single file that was pushed to all Tesla vehicles. We already see toothbrushes that communicate via your smartphone with um, um, perhaps your dentist will then tell you, look, you don't brush enough, or <coughs> even more worryingly, your insurance company. <coughs> And you may think what the flat thing on top of, of this is. Um, this, is um, this is a device that you put in your shoe. And instead of being a moron here in, in Riga walking around with your map or with your expensive smartphone, no, this thing is connected and will simply tell your foot where to go. <laughs> it does, however, raise issues because do you ever, as a consumer, own this product? You may own the physical product, but everything around it has turned into a service. And that means that there are questions of ownership and licensing. So, that raises a number of questions in relation to exhaustion of rights. Can you freely transfer your Tesla car to the next owner? No, you require the involvement of Tesla because the next owner will otherwise get a car without updates. It will be an outdated product. So, rights to process and use, transfer or exclude or destroy will be subject to licensing terms in relation to the thing. The thing is no longer a thing, it's a service that you are offered as well. And in the context of the debate in relation to use soft versus Oracle or the ongoing debate in terms of media content, can you transfer your ebook? Can you sell it freely to somebody else? I think 
someone needs to think again about the way in which we deal with exhaustion of intellectual property rights. Also, Internet of Things devices will be heavily dependent on all kinds of intermediaries. Intermediaries that collect data, intermediaries that analyze data, and then push it to the proprietor or the supplier of the service, if you will, and back onto the device. That creates all kinds of questions in relation to intellectual property lockups in ecosystems, because all the IP interconnected with each other, patents, software, and the like, will all be going through, and we know the players, will be going through the Googles, will be going through a very limited number of players who are in charge of the distribution market, the Apples, the Googles, and the likes. So, that means that something, and we've heard uh, Ms. Yona talk about this uh, as well, that something needs to be done in terms of controlling these types of markets and having a more unified policy on IP and standards and standard setting. So, something to consider there as well. So, in conclusion, 3D printing may be disruptive, bioprinting may be disruptive, and the Internet of Things certainly is disruptive in terms of technology, but there are also wonderful opportunities here for producers of products in order to bring products closer to consumer and to have a much more direct interaction and well, customer relation, let's put it like that, with end consumers. On the other side of this, that increased level of control in relation to the Internet of Things will also prompt us to reassess the way in which we deal with IP dominant firms because they will have much more control. In terms of 3D and bioprinting, I've said this before as well, um, it will be a matter of defining what type of IP regime this will be subject to. Do we in future give in to the early push that we already see to take away that barrier between commercial and private use in industrial property law? Or perhaps more imminently, we need to reassess the way in which we now define the in patent and design law, perhaps also in copyright law, issues of direct and indirect infringement, <coughs> because this is where we see immediate disconnects in the European market. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. I guess we're going to be uh, meeting the 57% uh, in Thingiverse and probably learn a lot uh, more about our students and our children uh, in the process. Uh, the next speaker will be Ruta Olmane, and she will be speaking on Regulation 608-2013. Uh, Ruta is a dual graduate, graduate of the University of Latvia. She is both a lawyer and also a Master of Public Administration. She is a Latvian and European trademark attorney and has been a practitioner for 16 years. She is first vice president and council member of ECTA, a board member of the Latvian National Group of AIPPI, a member of the Latvian Association of Patent Attorneys, and a regular, regular lecturer uh, on intellectual property matters. So I'm very pleased to welcome Ruta Olmane. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It seems uh, like uh, yesterday weather hit me and I'm a little bit out of the voice, but I hope I will survive until the end of my presentation. So first of all, I would like to thank Patent Office uh, for inviting me. It is a great pleasure to be uh, here uh, and the part of uh, so distinguished uh, panel as we have 
um, today. Uh, so, um, what comes to my presentation, I will focus on the new custom reg regulations, but I would like to start with uh, uh, some words about the previous work done by the European Commission in uh, close collaboration with the member states. And uh, of course, as uh, mentioned by uh, Ms. Jorna yesterday, uh, before uh, start any new legislation initiatives, uh, the Commission uh, uh, handled a lot of work with, uh, with uh, analysis of the previous one. And the custom uh, regulation also were analyzed and uh, questioned. And these are the main questions which were posed to the uh, uh, different uh, targeted groups. Uh, I will not name them, but of course, uh, one of the most important and one of the most hottest of course, was with uh, regarding the goods in transit, which um, which is uh, very uh, um, crucial and very hot and and widely discussed uh, topic uh, nowadays as well. Uh, so then the range of IP, uh, IPR rights, uh, of course, the illicit parallel trade, the simplified procedure, and small consignments, and and then the costs. So uh, the study shows that uh, there are a need to adopt the new regulation. So that on uh, 12 of June on 2013, uh, the new regulation were adopted and is applied already for one year since uh, uh, 1st January 2014. Uh, the main objections uh, of the uh, EU Commission was simplify, clarify, and enforce. And uh, let's see whether they succeed with uh, these objections. Uh, so the short overview, it's quite hardly to say that, but uh, the uh, uh, short ov overview of the custom accident procedures actually remain almost uh, the same as, uh, uh, as uh, under the previous uh, regulation. Uh, there are the same uh, options for application. Ex officio actions also remain. Uh, and then after the detention of the suspicious goods, there are options of uh, simplifi simplified procedure. And if it's not agreed on that, there is uh, further legal proceedings available in, in uh, this regard. The new thing is uh, the, the special simplified procedure uh, with regarding the small consignments, I will talk about that a little bit later on. So first and the most important issue is that uh, uh, the uh, new regulation expand the scope of IP uh, rights protected and, uh, and uh, um, covered by these custom regulations. So if previously we have a trademarks, copyright, design right, patent, plant variety, and designation of origins, then uh, the new regulation expand that also to the uh, trade names, semiconductor, topographies, plant varieties, uh, uh, and beyond, and also uh, uh, expand uh, the scope of protection from identical trademarks to confusingly similar trademarks. Uh, so if we look at the statistics provided by EU Customs then we can see that uh, uh, this is the statistics for the years until uh, 2013. And the statistics shows that actually uh, trademarks are the, the big portion of uh, the all cases where the custom measures are applied. So my doubt is that noting that trademarks uh, take so large amount of all these custom seizures uh, it means that actually with uh, more not so obviously seen uh, and more complicated IP issues, the customs are not very successfully dealt <coughs> until the uh, adoption of the new regulation. So whether the customs will be so well uh, experienced and, and knowledgeable in order to detain and to evaluate the infringement of all these new IP uh, rights now included in the, in the um, new custom regulation, 
I'm very doubt about that, but of course the time and statistics will show that more clear. So as regard the customs uh, action application, statistics shows that it grows constantly, so it means that actually the IP right holders use this um, options and, uh, and uh, uh, become uh, more satisfied probably by these actions taken by customs, so the application grows uh, in time period very uh, constantly. So as regard the new regulation, uh, the uh, applications forms uh, remain uh, the same. There will be a national applications and there will be a union applications. Uh, so it means that there will be a, the remain the same system, there will be a two kind of applications. What is new that the e-filing option is uh, introduced, so it means that it makes uh, life more easier for IP right holders to submit all this additional information about the how, uh, uh, what kind of rights are protected and how would look uh, possible infringement products. Now it could be uh, uploaded in, uh, in, e in e format and it of course make uh, life of IP right holders uh, much more easier. Uh, then uh, already mentioned by um, previous speaker, this database uh, is uh, <coughs> in plans to be introduced. So I think this uh, exchange of information is uh, very uh, useful for the IP right holders and of course useful for practitioners who is dealing with that with the customs authorities. Uh, so, if we look at the results of the det detention, then we can see that 76% uh, <coughs> of, uh, uh, of all cases uh, ending with uh, destruction of the goods. Uh, not all of them uh, are mandatory should be go through the court after the court actions. Uh, so, it means that actually the uh, situation uh, at the end of the 2013 shows that uh, also the simplified procedure is uh, 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 very often used uh, by, by the customs authorities and accepted by the uh, importer of the goods and ap uh, applied very often. So the new, custom, uh, uh, the new customs regulation uh, states that uh, the simplified procedure now become compulsory to all member states. So there is no need to transpose that uh, these provisions into national laws, but it is possible to apply the uh, regulation directly and they will uh, quite, um, uh, quite um, uh, specific uh, provide all these regulations about the timing and, and the um, requests going back and forth with the customs and, and, and the owners of the goods. Uh, so uh, important uh, is that under this simplified procedure the customs uh, may deem that the uh, holders or the declarant of the goods uh, has agreed to their destructions uh, where there have been no oppositions to the proposed destructions within 10 working days of the uh, notification so this Proceedings come into the force and uh, the goods are uh, destroyed. Uh, as regard the small consignments, which was very uh, wi uh, widely debated before, and some statistics afterwards will show probably why, uh, uh, I should uh, underline that uh, this is uh, uh, a good step uh, uh, further to, to solve this uh, problem. And what does it mean, small consignments? Uh, the regulation provides that there is a, a postal or express courier consignments, uh, which should uh, follow two um, rules. It should uh, contain no. It should uh, contain uh, three units or less, or and uh, each uh, has a gross weight of less than two kilos. Uh, so it means that if uh, you will. Uh, uh, just stick a small uh, box into your custom application and, and uh, uh, agree that you are um, agreed this uh, provisions of small consignments. Uh, the customs will apply these rules 
and then these small consignments will be destroyed without uh, uh, much work for IP right holders. If we look at the statistics, and here I have two slides, one after each other, the uh, previous year shows that the highest number of the cases <coughs> detained by the means of the transport is uh, cases detained at the post. So it's mean that much more than other ones. But if you look at the articles detained in these uh, post cargoes or parcels, then you see that there are very small amount of the articles in, in this. It means that actually this um, provisions about the small consignment should be very uh, popular and welcomed by the trademark owners. Uh, however, the Latvian national practice shows that uh, probably due to that is a new system or some other reasons, uh, this box is not ticked so often as we expect it, it should be. So it means that actually there are downsides of this uh, small consignment uh, tool. And <coughs> what I see as the downsides is that the uh, owners of IP rights are not informed about these um, detainments. So it means that they will not receive any information that customs act and, and detain something and destroy something. So it means that they cannot follow how these uh, infringing goods uh, look alike, where, what the tendencies of the, how it is in reach is not, inform, not uh, come to this, uh, inf this information not come to the IP right holders. And the uh, other things which I also think might be uh, as a reason why the small consignment is not applied so often is that <coughs> trademark owners, uh, IP right owners, um, overtake some liabilities to cover the costs regarding the destruction and storage. And once the customs very actively detain these uh, uh, small consignments, of course the cost might not be so high, but nevertheless they will uh, create some amount of the money by the end of the year or the period, a uh, certain period when the trademark owners start to interesting about that. So it means that this is unpredictable costs and probably the um, IP right owners are not yet ready to accept them without being informed about that they might uh, raise. So the main disappointment um, uh, well, while reading this um, new trade, uh, new customs regulation, I see that uh, you will not find uh, provisions regarding the goods in transit. Uh, also the uh, costs uh, mostly remain on the shoulders of IP right holders to bear all the costs and uh, in the cases when they can um, find the uh, real owner or the real person who is responsible for this cargo, then they can just uh, enforce this reimbursement of costs. Practice shows that actually usually, in, as, at least in Latvia, uh, you will see only the uh, company who is transport these goods you don't see the real sender or recipient of these goods. So it means that the costs mostly remain on the shoulders of IP right holders. Uh, also, you will not see the uh, regulation regarding the parallel import, the overruns, and the goods of uh, non-commercial nature. So it means that the new regulation will not cover these questions at all. Uh, as regards the goods in transit, the regulations say, say that uh, it will deal solely with the uh, uh, content procedural rules for the custom authority and the goods in transit are not the subject which should be dealt by this regulation. So now we are expecting the uh, new trademark <laughs> leg uh, legislation package which should solve this question. Uh, there are articles uh, dealing with uh, goods in transit in both, in uh, uh, trademark regulation and in uh, trademark directive. Uh, these documents currently are um, discussed at the trialogue at the Commission and uh, in Europe. So, and, and, but it's, these provisions are discussed very hardly because it's not uh, only the IP rights holders who are interested in this question. There are a lot of objections from the companies who, which business is a transit as such. 
So they are very much against that these provisions are uh, including in this um, roadmap package. So, but uh, as far as I know, the discussion is closed with regarding this articles, but we never know which come up during the trialogue. Uh, we are very much looking forward for the uh, ending of these discussions and to the adoption of this uh, package under the Latvian presidency. I hope it will be done by May, but it's uh, very hard political decisions under this one. So then the last slide is um, uh, concerning uh, the national issues. I um, uh, pick up some problems which are raised uh, while the previous um, uh, regulation were applied, and then also some political issues, which I also would like to highlight here there, because when we remember uh, yesterday presentation of Ms. Yorna, uh, she said that Mr. Juncker said that it is important to uh, state where we are because when the Brussels are doing the politi politics and adopt certain rules, they are not always in line with the uh, political levels and the, the practical situation in the national, in the member states, at the national level. And what I find out that uh, previous work for decades uh, shows that our customs are well, quite well trained. Uh, they are, the, we had a special, special unit in the main custom board dealing with IP matters, but uh, since uh, one year already, this unit is um, eliminate. And now if you need to find some information from the customs regarding the IP matters, you have to go to the several people and there is no one unit who deal with that and I would say that this is uh, our national political level, which are not going in line with all these Brussels uh, guidelines, where it uh, uh, says that it should be the most important thing, the IP are the most important thing, it's uh, influenced to the growth on the markets and so on, but national level is not following these guidelines. Uh, then, of course, um, uh, the question uh, of uh, the national rules, imposing this uh, regulation, um, uh, 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 custom regulation, uh, is still not adopted uh, uh, in Latvia. So it means that already one year, our customs working without these uh, rules, how to apply this uh, regulation where it's need to be applied through the national laws. Uh, uh, also, the previous uh, court practice shows quite inconsistent decisions and we are still have a doubt about the application of the statements of the IP right holder. And as uh, Mr. Meyer mentioned that uh, the owners of IP rights will be the ones who, the, um, who would be the most important about what is protecting by the IP rights. So it means that their statements would be the core evidence whether these IP rights are infringed or not. But once it comes to the national level, then it's not always uh, quite clear. And the question whether this is sufficient evident, evidence is uh, still questioned question at the court uh, level. Uh, I see that question about the confusingly similar uh, trademarks will be solved by the adoption of this uh, new regulation. And I think it, it's, uh, it's very good because so far, no, it was not uh, solved. And uh, the goods in transit in Latvia, we have a quite specific uh, situation because our customs detain the goods in transit in spite of the um, um, jurisdictions, uh, um, the decisions of the European Court. So we detain that and there was no one who questioned this uh, um, rights to, to detain the goods in transit very closely, so, so far the uh, goods were uh, destroyed. But these questions are actual and I hope the new regulation will show that some of them at least will be um, solved. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Rota. Uh, 
Our, uh, our next speaker is a representative of industry, and we are very much looking forward to the perspective of a right holder on intellectual property enforcement. Indra Yonan Uosha is the head of the patents division at Grindex, a uh, joint stock company, which is a pharmaceuticals manufacturer here in Latvia, uh, exporting around the world. Uh, Indra holds a bachelor's, a master's, and a doctorate in chemistry. Uh, has been with Grindex since 2003 uh, as a chemist, and she has been head of the patents division since 2009. And her work responsibilities include examination of new inventions, evaluation of patentability, infringement clearance search, uh, and preparation of formalities for patent filing all around the world. Dear ladies and gentlemen, hello, and uh, Latvian presidency in 2015 authorizes me to speak in Latvian as one of the official languages of the EU. The ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to address uh, such a distinguished uh, audience and share my experience of the rights holder, of the IP rights holder, on the application or the enforcement of the IP rights from the holder's perspective. And let me briefly introduce to you the company that I represent. Grindex is one of the leading pharmaceutical companies in the Baltics. Uh, Grindex was uh, founded in 1946, actually, way back in 1946. Apart from headquarters, um, uh, we also have our branches and we employ around 8,000 people. We manufacture generic products and we also research active um, substances and patent them, uh, sell them, distribute them as well. We're especially in cardiovascular uh, medicine as well as neurological medicine and uh, oncological medicine or anti-cancer medicine. We are producing uh, Terraflu and Mildronauts, uh, you know, among other medicines. So we're exporting our products to more than no, uh, 59 countries globally. Our main sales markets for uh, those medicines are, of course, Baltic countries, Russia, and other CIS countries. Whereas for the active agents, um, we uh, ship those to the Netherlands, Canada, United States, and uh, France. Uh, active agents are highly demanded, uh, and uh, um, one of them is uh, ZAP. Podan and uh, septin that are used by agriculture. Uh, so septin is, uh, you know, generating 95% of our turnover. And the exports of these medicines are contributing to 95% of our exports. In order to use the rights, we must register them first. Up to 2006, all the IPs as well dealt uh, within our company on the outsourcing basis. However, as we grew aware of uh, the importance and the value of the IP, in 2006, we decided to create a dedicated unit within our company to deal with the IP issues. At the moment, we have four people working in the IP department and dealing with the IP protection and other related issues. So we are, are you know, uh, searching for 
patents in order to clarify what sort of patents are available on the market. We also sort of analyze uh, the patentability of our products. Uh, we prepare all the patent paperwork and documentation and uh, applications in order to submit our patent applications in the countries where we would like to get our uh, products patented, although we're managing the IP uh, issues ourselves, we also use uh, the services of patent uh, or authorities uh, as well as managers, and we use intermediaries in general as well. Now, as regards to facts and figures in 2012, we uh, filed more than uh, 20 uh, patent applications in total, and uh, the same concerns, uh, trademark registration and design uh, registration and domain registration. I could go on forever, but you know the bottom line is that we deal with all the sort of aspects of IP protection within our company. So what concerns IP holders, you know, being an IP holder is be like being a policeman or a watchdog. You know, we have to constantly monitor those markets where our IP uh, needs to be protected. And let me just mention some of the examples. For example, in Ukraine, you know, our generic products uh, way back in 2016 were no longer protected by the patents. And now there are 11 variations of milder nuts sold on uh, the Ukrainian market. Although the patent has expired, we still have the patent uh, for other forms of, uh, of milder nuts, and we still hold the patent for the uh, manufacturing technology, uh, and uh, we ensure the protection through the trademark registration as well as the kinds of uh, market protection means that are used by us in order to protect our rights to Mildred Nuts. It's, it's very important because there are other competitors who register, you know, their rights to use of Mildred Nuts and they use, you know, um, different similar trademarks in order to mislead uh, the consumers. Well, there are certain aspects that we have to take into consideration to identify violation or breach of intellectual property right, but I'll be talking more about patents. Well, to understand whether we have grounds to consider that intellectual property right has been violated or could be violated. And I will talk about these activities which could be a sign of such potential violations. Well, for example, we have to look at the medicines register of the specific country where the generic medicines are being registered. And also when we conduct monitoring, uh, we have to look at the, into the databases and we sometimes find, find new patent applications or utility models as, as that uh, protect some of those uh, substances that are important for the company or some of the features which are important. And of course, at present, we have uh, uh, Chinese competitors who are trying to patent uh, even things that have been known that are just technical, certain technical level. And it's really surprising um, that sometimes uh, also Chinese uh, patent experts recognize in an invention to be as uh, 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 that can be patented. And sometimes they provide patent protection for uh, an already protected in, uh, invention. With regard to Mildronate compound, uh, we, uh, we opposed the to patentability, and we had three cases last year when we submitted uh, to, Ch to, Ch uh, to Chinese patent office evidence that this invention was not new and it was not and it had no patentability. And the second option is is to get in touch with a potential violator of intellectual properties, and we have to refer to our intellectual property rights. We send a notification, we send a letter, so that they later would not come with uh, objections that they had not been informed about uh, our actions. 
And here we uh, sometimes also receive letters uh, pointing to the intellectual property of third persons because, as I noted, we also produce generic medicines. Uh, that's why we can also end up in a situation when someone is pointing to an intellectual property which is owned by this party. The next uh, point, whenever we submit a claim with regard to a violation of patent right, we have to take into account that the defendant could always submit a counterclaim uh, doubting the patentability of our invention. And so, and if the patent is no longer valid, then you can no, lo can no longer have a violation of intellectual property right. And uh, so we always uh, look, uh, we always analyze if the inventory is pay has this patentability. But sometimes you can end up with a situation where you have this level of technology, uh, something that we had not uh, uh, found or uh, identified in an exotic language, and this could be detrimental for us. So you have always, uh, you should always take into account this situation, even though this risk is minor. Nevertheless, it exists. And this, even if you have had expert assessment of patent application, at the, uh, at the time when the case is heard, no patent system guarantees this validity of the patent at the time when the case is heard by a court. In some jurisdictions, the cases of patent violations and patentability are examined jointly. In other systems, the issue of patentability is heard by another court or is addressed, uh, referred to the patent uh, office of the specific country. And whenever you start litigations, you can never predict the duration of the whole proceedings. And one of the last important aspects that you should take into consideration uh, you must understand, even if you've made meticulous calculations of the litigation costs, you will have to review them whenever new evidence appears in the course uh, of a case hearing. Uh, and now one specific case. We had a case in Georgia. We had protection uh, for, for, for utility model protecting a product. Initially, we found information um, in the register in the Georgian National Register of Medicines that the product was being registered. And uh, we identified uh, that the product contained all essential elements and that our intellectual property right was being violated. We sent a letter of warning to the company. The company did not respond. We repeated this action. We sent uh, the letter once again to the company. And of course, we were informing about this breach of intellectual property right. And then when we had no response coming from the company, then we uh, submitted official uh, claim to a Georgian court about violation of utility model and auxiliary claim requesting uh, compensation of damages for material, for pecuniary damages that had been caused to us. And the Georgian court in the first instance ruled uh, uh, to satisfy the claim in full. However, the defendant uh, submitted a counterclaim uh, asking uh, to recognize the utility model as being invalid, uh, doubting its uh, novelty. And the defendant also, in addition to this, requested uh, uh, the Center of Intellectual Property of Georgia uh, to re-examine this utility model and it was recognized uh, that uh, the utility model had no novelty, pointing to the two informations that before that had not been available to us. And so this is a very vivid example of the case that before we start applying, enforcing our intellectual property right, we should take into consideration uh, that the result, uh, we should be aware that the result would not be always positive for us, uh, that we will always succeed in defending our intellectual property right in full. Of course, the field of uh, pharmaceuticals is unique in the meaning that the strongest patent protection is for the substance or the initial active pharmaceutical substance. 
but even though the substance is protected, at least eight years pass until we get this product that we can market. And so to extend this patent protection of the active substance, we always uh, we always evaluate the possibility for extending this patent protection. Even though in the patent uh, system we have some additional means of protection like certificates and so on, and in some country, but in some countries it's impossible to extend this patent protection. And then we achieve this additional protection by submitting patents for protecting indications, indications and for protecting uh, procedures and formula. We always uh, try to assess whether it would be possible for us to extend the protection. Some additional considerations in a, in a pharmaceutical field or in chemistry. It's rather complicated, really, to put forward very clear claims regarding protection of intellectual property rights, to put it very simply. There are violations of intellectual property rights, and it's rather difficult to prove it. And for example, patents of uh, procedures. This is rather complicated. Even if the procedure is very effective and can be used in industry, sometimes you cannot, uh, you cannot provide direct evidence that the competitors are using exactly this procedure and are violating your rights. Sometimes you have, sometimes those patents are more of the kind nice to have uh, than uh, intellectual property rights that you can really prove. That was very briefly about our experience and some aspects that we take into consideration in uh, cases like these. When we really have an actual case, and then you see that it's not that easy to enforce your intellectual property right, even if you have it, have it. And the whole the whole procedure of enforcing your rights is rather complicated. Uh, thank you very much. I think that the uh, speakers have pointed out from different aspects how incredibly complicated enforcement is. And because of that, uh, with Mr. Meyer's permission, uh, perhaps we could uh, pull up his presentation? Uh, because he had some slides uh, that I uh, rushed him through, for which I do apologize, but which speci specifically have to do with training that the uh, EU Observatory does uh, for judges and for people interested uh, in such things. Could you pull up Meyer? The first presentation. And, and perhaps I can give you the, the floor so you can... Uh yeah, well, I, I stay here. So oh, okay, yeah. Give me the, the, the pointer. Absolutely. Well, yes, indeed. I mean, it's, uh, training is the, the fourth uh, element of what we're doing uh, most in the, in the observatory. And there are several aspects of training uh, that I think are really worth it. You just said it now, and we just heard it from the speech. Um, intellectual property, and I've been doing this for now more than 30 years, is actually awfully complicated. Uh, and uh, if you want uh, enforcement authorities to... Uh, Make sure that uh, it's a long way to get to the training, as you can see, but um, we'll get there, don't worry. Uh, so, indeed, uh, what you need to do, first of all, is to make sure that the enforcement authorities, which have an awful lot to do, I mean, um, if you uh, have never looked at the instructions of a customs officer, for example, uh, you cannot imagine just how much the customs authorities have to implement because uh, everything that goes from health regulations, standards in industrial products, uh, 
of course, general tax law, taxation law, intellectual property, all these are elements that a customs officer must enforce. They are, of course, now more and more specialized in some of the aspects of it, but still. <coughs> Now, intellectual property is um, uh, 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 hugely complicated and, and it's important. And um, it is complicated as well. And there's, I would maybe take uh, the, the advantage of having the floor to say, how do you possibly want the customs officer to check whether what is imported is the result of an overrun that you have uh, in violation of a license agreement with somebody producing your products legally in a third country? I mean, just forget about it. Uh, I mean. Uh, if you have a contact with someone to produce 1,000, make sure he produces 1,000. If he produces 2,000, sue him in the country uh, where uh, the, the law says that uh, the contractor uh, should apply and, and leave customs officers doing the rest of their job. Um, the, what sort of trainings do we do? We try to be practical, okay? Um, what we do uh, at least twice a year is um, specialized conferences that bring together customs authorities, police, prosecutors more and more. We collaborate very closely with Eurojust. The next one we're going to have is very early June on cosmetics because there too you have to be very specific. Okay? Uh, we now have the results of the study of the quantification of infringement in cosmetics. It's huge. Okay? So what we will do, we will bring together some limited uh, representatives from the private sector, those who have had very specific cases of imports or distribution in the European Union of counterfeit cosmetic products. They will tell us their experience and they will exchange with the prosecutors, with the, the, the uh, other enforcement authorities and eventually with judges. And on the basis of this experience, there will be a synergy, people will know much better what the problem is, what the various angles of the problem uh, are. Uh, and we have done this now for pesticides, for food stuff, uh, for uh, sport articles. Uh, the one on sport articles we did just three months before the World <laughs> Cup in Brazil and we had our Brazilian friends for enforcement uh, who were there and explained what they were doing to prepare. And there was um, a liaison between the European enforcement authorities and the Brazilians. I would like to add that we always make sure that our friends from the United States of America are there too, and they are working a lot uh, on these subjects. So on the one hand, there is training, but there is also networking between the authorities, okay? What we also will do the later on is a specific... Tāpat tās mēs arī tālākajos posmos arī piedavājam īpašas um, apmācības tādā tiecībā uz dizainu paraugiem un līdzīgiem izstrādājumiem. Tāpat tās arī piedavājam reģionālas seminārs, reģionālas semināri, nu ir tā kā tīri Eiropas tādi semināri, uz kuriem uzaicina, teiksim, deviņu desmit tādu dažādu iestāžu pārstāvi. Es atvēju, uz deviņu desmit dažādu valstu atbildīgo iestāžu pārstāvis no prokuratūras, no policijas, no citām tiesību aizsardzības institūcijām un tā tad šī te programma ir nu, veidota pēc Dānijas modeļa, tā tad šis te modelis nāk no Dānijas un tad mēdz ir nodrošināt to, ka policija muita un prokuratūra un citas iestādes spēja apkarot attiecīgā izstrādājuma ražošanu konkrētajā dalajā valstī un šogad paredzēt divu šādi semināru, reģionālie semināri, tā tad viens notiks Itālijā, kā jau minēja, un otrs notiks Ungārijā oktobra beigās, no sākumā un tuvākajā laikā sāksim organizēt jau tātad šos te seminārus. Bet, nu, ja mēs runājam vēl specifiskāk tātad par policistu apmācījām, jūs varbūt zināt vai nezināt, bet mums ir CEPOL, tātad jeb šī te Eiropas policijas koledža, kurs uzdevums ir apmācīt policijas, virsnieks policistus, tātad visā Eiropā dažādos jautājumus finanšu noziegumus, citos noziegumu veidos, un mums, protams, interesē tas, lai viņi būtu arī zinoši intelektuālā īpašu pārkāpņu jautājumus, un mēs uzaicinām, labēram, 60 policistus tādu uz īpašām apmācībām, kas ilgst veselu nedēļu, tas notiek Alikantē, Spānijā, un tātad šogad arī tās arī tiks organizētas, tātad gadu otrajā pusē, tātad būs arī tātad dažādu praktisku pie 
piemēru analīze, būs tātad arī dažādu juridisko mehānismu analīze, tātad juridisko normu analīze, tātad, kas ir saistīts ar šo te darbu un tātad arī citu operatīvo darbību apmācības, tātad, kas ir paredzēts specifiski konkrēti tieši tiesības sargājušo orgānu darbiniekiem. Nu, un, protams, ka mēs arī mēģinām šādā veidā vairot viņu vispārējā zināšanas par intelektuālā īpašuma tiesību aizstāvību, tātad vairojam arī viņu spēju, tātad, nu, nekavojoties reaģēt uz šiem te pārkāpumiem, māca viņiem arī, kā teiksim, strādāt ar tiesu, jeb tātad procesu virzītājiem šādos gadījumos. Nu, un vēl viens apmācību veids, kas ir vērsts uz Eiropas prokuroru kontaktīku izveidošanu, ir tātad apmācības intelektuāli īpašuma tiesību jautājumos, tātad, lai izveidot šādu prokuratūru, prokuratūru, proru kontaktīklu kopā ar OHIM, tātad organizējam šādas pasākumas. Arī ar Eurojust, piemēram, mēs arī ļoti cieši sastrādājamies arī mūsdienās, tad Eurojust ir Eiropas sveriņas dienests, nu, kur pārstāvis, kurā ir pārstāvēts visas prokuratūru, visu dalību valstu prokuratūru darbinieku, tātad Un Eurojust garantē to, ka gadījumā, kad Eiropas Savienība nosūt pieprasījumu, tātad tiesiskās palīdzības pieprasījumu, kādā nozīguma izmeklēšanai, kādā citā valstī viņi nosūt tādu šo tie informāciju uz kādu. Un, un tātad informēja lūk, mums ir šāda lieta, kur acīvredzot ir saistība arī vēl citām trim valstīm, vai jūs varētu lūdzu informēt attiecīgo valstu prokurors, lai mēs varētu efektīvāk izmeklēt konkrēto gadījumu. Tātad Eurojust būtībā tāda koordinē tāda prokuratūra darba atsevišķos, atsevišķās lietās, kas ir saistīts ar vairāk kā valstīm. Nu, tāda runa par operatīvo sadarbību. Eurojust, protams, pazīstos prokurors uz zinu, kurās lietās prokurori specializējās ar viņiem. Es esmu parakstījušies arī vienošanās protokolu, lai garantētu to, ka ar vien vairāk vairāk prokurori tātad iestājusās intelektuāli īpašumu lietu izskatīšanā. Mēs tiešām gribam izveidot šādu prokuroru kontaktīklu, kas regulāri tiekās, tad arī es gadā gribam pulcēt to salikantē vai kaut kādās citās apmācības, lai tādā veidā garantētu šo te tiesību ievērošanas kontroli. Nu, protams, protams, šim te prokuroriem nepieciešams apmācības īpašuma tiesību jautājumos, tā intelektuāli īpašuma tiesību jautājumos, jo daudz no viņiem varbūt nespecializējās šobrīd šādās lietās. Tāpēc esam strādājuši arī tiesnešiem pie preču zīmēm, dizainu paraugiem, tā tad vēl esam mācījuši viņus jau kopš 2006. gadā, apmēram 600 seminārs, apmēram 600 tiesneši ir izgājuši, tā tad šos, šos te seminārus kopā ar Eiropas patentu iestādi mēs jau organizējam, tā tad arī šādas, piemēram, apmācības, tā tad patentu tiesnešiem tā saucājumē, un mēs tā tad kopš 2006. gadā apmācības, un, protams, ka daudz tiesneši nodarbojas ar abām lietām, gan ar preču zīmēm, gan ar patentiem, bet, nu, mēs tātad, kā jau minēja, ar patentu iestādi, Eiropas patentu iestādi, organizējam šādas apmācības patentu iesnešiem tā saucamajiem. Nu, lūk, un ir vesela vīri, ka dažādi citi apmācību, ko plānojam, ņemot vairāk to, ka ir nepieciešams arī, nu, tātad aizsargāt šīs te tiesības, jābūt speciālistiem informētiem, un tātad viltoto preču tirzniecību internetā būs nākamā tēma, par ko organizēsim tātad apmācības 27. martā pārstāvēt ar šādu dalību valstību, tātad, nu, runās, tātad iepazīstinās ar problēmu konkrētās dalību valstīs, tā būs pirmā dienas daļa un otrajā daļā, tātad pēcpusdienā un otrajā dienā tātad tiesneši tātad uzstāsies. Mēs jau neizliekamies, ka mēs apmācam tiesnešu. Mēs viņiem aprakstam esot situāciju, raksturojam to, un tad ļaujam, lai viņi paši spriež par to, kā arī zināt šīs te lietas, izskatīt tās. Mums parasti ir tāda mācība, tātad lieta, tātad neīsta lieta, tātad, ko mēs viņam piedāvā izskatīt. Tāpēc tās arī mēs runāsim par to, kā civiltiesiskā un krimināla likuma paredzētajā kārtībā ir izcināt tātad dažādas lietas, kas ir saistīts arī intelektuāli īpašuma tiesībā un parasti tātad civilietas skatošajā un krimināla lietas civilietas skatošajā tiesnešu ļoti labi pārzina intelektuāli īpašuma tiesības mums ir arī tiesnešu, kas specializējās patentu un prezīmi ziņā, bet ja mēs runājam par kriminālu tiesisko vajāšanu, tad, nu, jāsaka, ka kriminālu lietas skatošajiem tiesnešiem trūzināšanu par šo te intelektuālu īpašumu aizsardzības jautājumiem un gadījumos, kad ja jāsastopas ar lietām, tad lielākā daļa lieta patiesībā tiek izskatīta civiltiesiskā kārtībā, bet gadījumos, kad ir nepie, nepieciešams, teiksim, arī, nu, nerūpīgāk izmeklēt šo te lietu, tad kriminālajiem tiesnešiem ir nepieciešams šīs te zināšanas. Es jau minēju arī to, ka mēs 
Alas mēģinām uzsvērt to lomu, ko intelektuāls īpašuma tiesību spēlē, tā tad attiecīgi ekonomikā. Runājam arī par tiem zaudējumiem, ka nes, tā tad dažādi izstrādājumi viltošana. Nu, un reizēm no arī ar krimināli lietām strādājošiem tiesnešiem nākās, teiksim, strādāt arī ar slepkavām, un vienā dienā jāskada lietas, kas saistīts ar preču viltošanu un slepkavību. Nu, protams, ka slepkavība ir daudz smagāks noziegums, un salīdzināt apdīvu lietas, tā tad, nu, intelektot īpašam tiesību pārkāpums tiek uztverts kā, nu, tāda maz svarīgāka lieta, tādēļ arī krimināli lietas skatošajiem tiesnešiem vajadzētu pilnvērtīgāk apzināties tiešām, nu, kādas ir seks intelektuālā īpašam tiesību pārkāpums. Un mēs to neiģinām panākt ar apmācībā, bet, nu, ir ļoti grūti šādās apmācībās iesaistīt krimināli lietas skatošos tiesnešus, jo, nu, krimināli lieta tiesnešiem jau nav divas dienas, lai ko pavadītu tā, un te viņiem pietiek, tā teikt, ar, ar ko strādā. Protams, ir nepieciešams, nu, ir jābūt konkrētam lietu skaitam attiecībā šādā, šādu tiesību veidu, tad, lai viņam būtu interesi iziet šādas apmācības, bet, nu, mēs mēģinām, protams, strādāt ar šiem te jautājumu piedāvājumu apmācības, arī krimināli lietas skatošiem tiesnešiem, kaut kādu varbūt citu apmācību ietvaros skaram, tā tad šos te jautājums. Nu, mēs vēl virkne apmācību kursu, kas pieejam, tas ir tas, ko mēs darām, strādājam pie tā nepārtraukt, ne, ne, Un turpināsim arī strādāt, nu, tiesneši arī, nu, mēdz mainīt valstis un reģions, kuros strādām, maina arī lietas, ar kurām strādā. Piemēram, Francijā tur maina, tiesneši pāriet no vienu lietu skatīšanas uz cit, pie citu lietu skatīšanas, bet, nu, mēs, protams, cenšamies arī to ņemt vērā. Un rezultāti jau ir redzami, nu, piemēram, preču zīmī tiesneši Latvijā, Eiropā jau zina ļoti labi, ar kuriem kolēģiem sazināties un, 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 un šie te kontakti jau veidojās. Es parunātu ar tiesnešiem, tad jūs noteikti no viņiem dzirdētu, ka, nu, kad Samsung un Apple tā tad mēģināja Eiropā, tad, tad ienāk, tad, nu, tiesnešiem bija ļoti bieži jāsazvanās nu, attiecībā uz šiem te jautājumiem. Nu, un tiešām šis te kontaktīklis ir ļoti vērtīgs, mēs turpinām pie tā strādāt. Un, nu, tās iestrādes jau mums ir, teiksim, diezgan tāds labs. So a, a few remarks uh, to recall some of the themes uh, in the presentations, and then I'd like to open the floor to concluding questions. And I don't know if the patent office is going to make some concluding, concluding remarks at the end. Yes, so then I will get a signal uh, when that is about to happen. Uh, Mr. Meyer, uh, in his presentation, uh, stated that the EU observatory has discovered that intellectual property is nice, but enforcing it is somebody else's uh, problem. Uh, I think that in, uh, in Mr. Sandra's presentation on 3D printing, we see how that somebody else manifests itself because if the infringement takes place online at a distance with production of an actual physical object totally physically removed from the creation of the IP right in the first place, you have a new, ter new uh, realm in which you have to enforce something which is uh, even more abstract than intellectual property is uh, in the first place. Uh, in our presentation uh, from Ruta Olmane on the new uh, customs regulation, uh, we learned about the attempts now to try and make it easier and quicker for customs to enforce intellectual property rights, which of course is limited, and certainly in the case of our member state, uh, by the fact that there is a uh, lack of regulations and the elimination of a specialized customs unit, leading one to ask whether we are moving forward into the brave new future of effective enforcement. Uh, perhaps we are simplifying uh, a little bit quicker uh, than we necessarily uh, could. And in our presentation on Grindex, Ms. Yonana Uosha pointed out that the real challenge is in enforcing rights across jurisdictions when outcomes can be very different, when you can get all sorts of surprises because of asymmetries, for instance, of information. And also, uh, in pharmaceuticals, one of the huge issues is how on earth to enforce that process patent. So those are just a few summarizing uh, remarks, but I'd be very glad to uh, open the floor to questions. Uh, 
thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Bayabat Rukshan, and I am the manager of the risk analysis uh, unit of the main customs board, and I have come with regard to the presentation of Ruta Olmane. Uh, I would like to make remarks with regard to customs you know, authorities. According to the new regulation, uh, or since last year, the customs authorities are not working according to customs regulations, what, we, what she claimed. Actually, you know, our customs authorities are working according to international law and according to European law, specifically, and now what concerns this new regulation, the uh, State Revenue Service and the, the main customs board has adopted an internal uh, instruction, you know, that very clearly specifies how to apply the the provisions of the regulation. As you know, regulation directly, you know, applies to member state or has to be implemented by the member state uh, directly. And although we don't have the cabinet of ministers regulation regarding uh, the European regulation. That does not necessarily mean that we are not abiding by the European regulation. You know, the work has begun already on the Cabinet of Ministers regulation and it's still to be submitted to the Cabinet. And although we do not have the national regulatory framework or regulation in place, we are working according to the regulation. And then you also mentioned that we don't have a dedicated unit or service to that. Indeed, uh, uh, State Revenue Service underwent uh, a massive re restructuring last year. Yeah, and 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 it, uh, this unit was shut down or it was closed, and the objective was to improve the work actually. So that was why it was merged or it was, you know, located elsewhere. And considering that we are working with the rights holders, you know, we have to have a proper risk analysis. So basically, this unit was relocated or became a part of another unit, and we regularly participate in all sorts of uh, training. And 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 we, we we do have the, the the joint training together with the rights holders. So that's my commendable remark uh, to what um, Ruth Allman has said about non-existence of the enforcement or a dedicated unit. Comments to the comments to my <laughs> speech. <laughs> then of course I should underline that the custom authority. I may agree with uh, Paul Meyer that actually customs authorities has a lot of work to do. A part of the IP right protection. And of course, uh, they have uh, limited sources to do that. And we all know how hardly the uh, crisis hit our uh, governmental institutions in the previous years. So I just want to uh, highlight this as a problem because uh, for the long run, I think it might be a problem if we will uh, uh, make this elimination of the people who are in long term were trained in this field and now this knowledge is transferred to actually probably nobody. So this is uh, not a good signal if we uh, see what uh, uh, Brussels or Central Europe expecting from the member states. But of course it's uh, no doubt that customs authority are, are doing a great work and I know that uh, they are trained in the IP field and the uh, trademark owners also put this effort uh, in order to educate them as much as they can. And I know that uh, twice a year um, customs authority organize these seminars and the trademark owners are welcome to attend and to provide this knowledge to the customs authorities. But of course uh, due to the daily uh, very a um, huge amount of the work, not always it is possible to get these people on these seminars for the whole day or, or half a day. So, but thanks for the, for the uh, comments. Uh, thank you. Maybe to discharge slightly uh, the, the weather <laughs> the situation, I would ask uh, Indra, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, that you, in Grindings you file third-party observations 
uh, and oppositions as well against Chin uh, Chinese colleagues filing uh, some some applications and so on. So, uh, could you please share us your experience? Uh, do you find, uh, in particular, uh, uh, third-party observations filed with the European Patent Office? Uh, do you find uh, do you find them uh, effective tool, or uh, is it, uh, in your opinion, better? to keep your arguments and to file them in a position. Thank you. Mm, yes, thank you for your question. Um, I think in Europe, uh, once we try to do that, uh, concerning process patents, of course, <laughs> because we have some doubts about this patentability and this patent uh, just like um, we couldn't, uh, we couldn't like uh, agree with the with the claim, claims because we totally disagree with the uh, with, uh, inventor's opinion that it is patentable. I think in Europe uh, we had this one, one time experience and it could be, uh, uh, it should be done by us as well. In uh, this case then we can file this third uh, part observation. In China it helps uh, once Again, as I said, uh, when we filed, uh, this uh, uh, patent examiner, examiner take into consideration and they didn't get patent granted in China. And for us, it was like... <laughs> uh, no, they didn't ignore, but uh, they just only uh, to be withdrawn, this patent was thereafter, because they didn't uh, continue with this patent. So, So it's like... But as we understand, they take into consideration our arg arguments as well. Perhaps I can add something to that because China <coughs> is a very specific situation. It has a, a patty patent system um, and um, this may create problems for foreign undertakings who are unaware of this. Take for example the Schneider Corporation who got hit with uh, a, a, a million dollar uh, case going against them. They thought that what the Chinese party had claimed as a patty patent was pretty trivial. Well, the pr problem with patty patents is unless you can get an, something novelty destroying, it's almost impossible to get it out of the way in terms of inventive step. So uh, there you go. You have um, a jurisdiction with um, a potentially very strong right over incremental innovation. Chinese Patent Acts also contains a petty patent system for the protection of, that's what it was designed for, traditional Chinese medicine. So that allows you to claim in relation to a new formulation for a known compound. Um, and that also creates possibilities for, for Chinese parties, but also for other parties to create real havoc in relation to uh, more like the, uh, the high-level <coughs> inventor patent. So you have to be very much aware of what is happening, not just in terms of the, the true patent application, but also of the patty patent systems in, in those jurisdictions. So I've been uh, informed we have time for one more question. Okay. Thank you very much uh, to our speakers, and I give the floor to the Patent Office.